Who want to eat your report? I believe it's recording. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, so what I'll tell you about is. Uh, in many ways, a very simple story It's all going to be gravity and it's relatively simple stuff, but it's also stuff that I think has not gotten a lot of attention around here, so I think that it might be worth talking about. I don't know if the arrow is going to work. Nope, arrows don't work. Yeah, when it rains, of course. Uh, where am I to look? <laughs> I was on it. Yeah, I did try to do this. Yeah, right. That's a game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to put her plug in. Yeah. Maybe remove the clicker if you're not using it because maybe it's not using the keyboard. No, there's no clicker. Oh. That's a good point. Did it just say there was before we get rid of the keyboard or? Turn it off now. Yeah. I mean, after two years, I thought we probably got it, but now. Never. Okay, what happened? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, we got it. I need a break. You wanted the second slide. Yeah, got it. Uh, uh, yeah. All right, so, so yes, I'm looking for things quite simple, and uh, then hopefully that you're also uh, uh, just to the rest of it. So, what I am talking about is just standard simple black hole thermodynamics. So, with the area law, I'm not going beyond it, all the foundations have to do with that. But I'm in the end just computing the entropy, the area of the class of black holes. And by thermodynamics, I mean we study the dependence on its mass and its charge and whatever else that there is around. And just as a reminder, if you were to do such a thing for an asymptotically flat Schwarzschild black hole that you get in your textbook GR course, then you'll find that the free energy is positive and increases, it decreases with temperature. That means that it has negative specific heat. And that means that there's instability. In other words, Schwarzschild black holes, they can decay, and they can decay to the thermal state, which is the uh, line in poor coloring that is down on the x axis. But that's the standard black hole. But I'm interested in particular in black holes and anti bisitter, and I'll stick to anti bisitter 5, because they're dual to any proposed supernovae, so that we're interested in. They have a rich phase diagram and one. Aspect of that that's interesting is that it has some similarities to real life QCD. And uh, well, that's one of the things that motivate that are interested. Accordingly, it has been extremely well studied. But there's one corner that seems to have been incredibly poorly studied. Somehow it just sort of fell out of most people's view back when we were doing a lot of this stuff. So that's what I'm going to try to fill in, which is discuss supersymmetric black holes in ADS5. They're kind of just literally a corner, as you'll see, that somehow people didn't zoom in on. So that's a small corner that I'll talk about, and the physics is, uh, is reasonably simple. In fact, let me remind you the story about the ADS-5 Schwarzschild black hole. Just Schwarzschild, so this is 
from Witten's famous paper, the first one on ABS-CFT. There are several branches. There are the so-called small black hole branch, that's the upper curved line. It starts with really high free energy, it goes down and down as the temperature gets bigger, so it moves a lot like that of the Schwarzschild black hole in flat space. And that's because it is like the Schwarzschild black hole in flat space. What small black holes means is that the radius of the black hole is small compared to the ABS curvature. So it looks like it's in flat space. But of course, the new thing is that when it's not small, then it's larger compared to the ABS radius. There's a new branch. That's the lower blue line, the large black hole called. And the two they meet in an interesting spot, the cusp, which has a minimal temperature. There simply isn't a possible to go to zero temperature. And that's going to be pretty important for us, actually, since I'm interested in supersymmetric black holes that want to go to zero temperature. And I'm already starting to be concerned that there is no zero temperature on the, on the graph. So the large black holes is what people often study when they uh, study ads CFT because they're interested in conformal fluid and it proposed nuclear metals, and that is indeed a very interesting thing to do, and I'm sympathetic to that. So in that same graph, still ads 5 Schwarzschild, so the stuff that one would have learned about in graduate school or before, is that um, the special point where the blue line, the lower one, the uh, large black hole branch cuts into the x-axis, that's called the Hawking cage transition. It is where the thermal gas, the red line, where the free energy is zero, so basically the x-axis, meets the large black hole branch. The understanding that we have, the interpretation we usually have of this, is that the free energy is all of one on the x-axis, so not literally zero, it just looks like zero because it's order one, and the rest is order n squared. So the large black holes are in some kind of deconfined phase, the quarks or whatever you might reasonably call the constituents are all allowed to float around. And that's why in an issue eight gates theory, you have order n squared different, um, different constituents. And this indeed does, at least at a very superficial level, look like that of a confined and deconfinement transition. The low temperature is confined, the high temperature is deconfined. You know, we're all going to get the QCD, right? And that, at any rate, is some of what is inspiring people to look more at this transition because it can be considered uh, in detail in the ADS CFT. But well, that was not my agenda. My agenda was to go to supersymmetric black holes. I use the word supersymmetry and DPS interchangeably. DPS is shorter, so that's what's often written. They obviously do not support conventional thermodynamics. That is because they must be at zero temperature. Zero temperature means that if you have other conserved charges around, like actual electric charge or perhaps angular momenta, the mass has to be as low as possible mass in that sector. In this case, for supersymmetry tells us that the mass, in fact, should be the sum of all the charges. There'll be five charges in the game. You can think about that as being two angular momenta in ABS5, five, five dimensions. There are two independent issues, two groups, so there are two independent angular momentum number, one of numbers, and then the corresponding. S5 has three independent quantum numbers that you could choose as thinking labels or whatever. But the option is that the mass is the sum of the charges, and therefore the mass is not actually an independent parameter. There are five independent parameters. And what we mean by thermodynamics, we're going to not study the energy because energy is not a free quantum number, but we're studying the dependence on the potentials. I'm going to call them phi and omega, that are the electric potential that's conjugate to Q and the rotational potential omega, the actual rotation that is conjugate to J. So that's what thermodynamics means is what is the dependence on these parameters. This will be a key result later. This is the phase diagram of the supersymmetric ABS-5 black hole. You will notice that it looks strikingly similar to the abs fortune black hole. There's an upper branch, small black hole. There's a lower branch, large black hole. There's a gas phase. And they meet at the Hawking cage transition. Of course, I can't quite be serious here because I told you the temperature is zero. So therefore, this water black hole had the temperature on the x-axis. Here, the temperature is zero. Well, I invented a new parameter called tau. That's kind of like the temperature. And similarly, the free energy will be exactly zero for the UPS black holes, but I invented a new one that's called W that'll be similar to the free energy. But with those identifications that, as you're going to see, are going to be pretty obvious, yes, that is what we must identify. 
then basically like, huh, the supersymmetric situation has a phase diagram that is about as interesting as that of the Schwarzschild black hole. And well, it has more technicalities, but it also has more things that you might end up exploiting to understand the phase diagram in great detail. So this is one reason that it's interesting to see, wonder if we could make this thing more precise. So my outline is that I will first go a little bit deeper on the non supersymmetric thermodynamics. So basically starting with the Schwarzschild black hole, but let's try to add one at a time and momentum and electric charge and see that as you do that, how do I get close to the biggest limit? What happens? As I basically try to tune these so I go to the black hole. And then when we've done that, I can introduce how would I actually do it just at initial for the supersymmetric black holes? I can introduce my potentials and discuss the supersymmetric phases of that diagram just kind of by itself without thinking about it as a limit. Or some other theory. And I will have a small aside here and the opportunity to talk a little bit about near stream black holes, which is nice because a lot of people are studying it. So uh, it gives one little point of contact here that will give, give you a chance to throw up names. Yeah. What is near horizon geometry? It's still ADS2. It's ADS2. ADS2, but the um, sphere like thing is. Much harder, or you get vibrations, whatever it's not part of it. It's a squash, that's it, it's a squash, yeah. But not your one of the mill squashing for torsion problem, but whatever. Think about this thing, three as three. So, so the free energy in the grand canonical example is a function of temperature. The electric retentions, as I mentioned, the phi, and I'm going to say they're actually three phi's. I'm just going to apologize that sometimes I make them all identical. Sometimes I have three different ones. It's a matter of whatever we want to identify. Same with the angle of velocities. We will do the conjugate to the angle momentum. There are two of them. I might make them equal often just for illustration. But what I really want to tell you is that the values of these potentials don't just take some continuum. There's a very important sort of boundary case of these potentials. If you look at the BPS mass, which as I mentioned was sort of the sum of the charges, but the sum of the angle momentum. If you look at the coefficients in front of those, the front in front of Q, when in fact I have three identical ones, it's going to be three. Uh, the ones in front of my momentum is going to be one. Those are not going to make, any, make, make identical because one actually means moving at the speed of light. So it's a bit of a special thing. You've got to complain if I said omega to move two. But uh, that may raise some special numbers. And the reason that I bring in these special numbers is that already when we are not in the supersymmetric case, we'll see that these special numbers. They turn up very, very clearly, even when you're quite far away from the supercentral limit. You should be very careful about whether you're below or above or at these particular numbers. Even though they are four, they don't mean much. But of course, if you think about this in light of supersymmetry, they do mean a lot. So, what's the dependence on angular velocity? Colors are not the greatest I can see, but um, I think you get the picture. The blue is the no rotation. That's actually the one I previously had. Think Schwarzschild black hole, upper branch, lower branch, and there's a thermal phase. The point is that as we turn more angle momentum on and make it increasingly less visible, then it goes <laughs> higher and to this side, monotonically. So the cusp goes higher, as in the maximum free energy is larger. Positive free energy is bad, it means unstable. So bigger one means probably worse, which means I turn on angle momentum, it kind of makes them more stable, more unstable. Uh, and I may also say that, well, the Hawking page temperature moves to this side, so it moved at lower temperature. Perhaps not entirely clear what that means, but one can at least construe that as also being consistent with rotation, sort of destabilizing the black holes. But that's at any rate my interpretation. We turn on rotation when you start with a Schwarzschild black hole. It gets more unstable, but otherwise similar to that of the black hole, of the of the of the unrotating black hole. Oops. What if instead I turn on electric potential? It looks much the same. It starts as blue and then becomes uh, increasingly less visible. In fact, here I turn on a given phi. So turn on some electric potential and then consider it for the same sequence of angle momentum as before. So what you really should do is to compare this with whatever was on the previous slide, which you obviously didn't memorize. But the point is that the entire thing moved to this side. They were notably high previously. They are less high. 
So the electric potential for a given angular momentum is actually bringing the free energy down. It's helping us stabilize the black hole. It's not as positive, and in fact, might conceivably in the end be not positive at all. It's being pushed down. In that case, too, when I turn on the potential, things are actually moved further to this side. And since what I want to go is to ultimately, for example, to zero temperature, I can see that turning on a potential and turning on a momentum might actually help me in both of them. And that's, of course, what we expect. So now let's try to turn it up just to three, turn up to the critical electric field. Is there the same sequence of different angle momenta going from zero? And up. What you see is that there is no small black hole branch. The upper branch, the large black hole branch that was on the previous slide, it kept going down, it got pushed down a bit further when I took different angle momentum, and eventually it got pushed so far down that it was gone. So there was a large and there was a small, but the large one simply disappeared when you go to. Three. This is why I'm telling you from the beginning this thing that three somehow has a special value. You know, 2.99 could qualitatively like all the rest. Three doesn't. So now there's no small black hole branch. In a way, that's nice. It means that these things are greatly stable now. There's nothing they can decay to. All that takes is the potential being three or above. I'm not super symmetric or anything like that. Um, the weak gravity conjecture guys sometimes get something out of this. Sometimes get it wrong, but anyway, sometimes get it right, something out of it. I would say that, oh, it's because when the mass is less than three cube, we simply don't have black holes. We have particles like that, and particles, but they're not black holes. So those are very interesting. They are in the theory, but that's not what I'm studying here. So that's why I don't see them. Um, well, that's at any rate something to say that, well, so that means when phi is less than three, those would be the ones that are sort of thermodynamically favored. When we're bigger than three, black holes are bigger. So that's some of the words you would set to this. I mean, it's not the whole story. The words don't fit entirely, but it's at any rate some of the words that would be set to this um, to this graph. Let me try what happened with my angular velocity. Let me turn my angular velocity up to the critical one. It spins at the speed of light. Now I consider what happens as I put it all the way up where I want to put it up, and then turn the potential from small to bigger. Well, it starts out here, sort of being red now, sort of in blue. And then as I turn more and more potential on, it moves this way. But the important part is that the free energy is always positive. If I take the angular momentum to one, I said that you should think about that as being sort of destabilized. Well, it's so bad that when I take it bigger and bigger, I take it to one, you don't have a choice. It's completely unstable. It's always positive free energy. It will be an unstable black hole. No matter what you do to your potential five, of course, unless we take it to be three, because then we have competition between two very strong things. One says it's only small, the other says only big. But at any rate, we are here in the rotation gets to decide if it's gone critical. And we see there's only the small black hole branch, it was very unstable. We do see as we turn on more and more potential, it goes further and further this way. And it will turn out that if we take the potential to three, then this asymptote will go all the way to zero. It's still pretty clear that that's not a good way to get to zero temperature because it would get to the zero temperature way up here. So although we sort of could hit the axis, going to the potential being three with first having turned on angle momentum, bad. First tune your potential to be three or above. To take it above, you can tune it down whenever you feel like it. But the way you can go to the critical value is that you first do angle momentum, first do electric field, then you do angle momentum. Angle momentum is more dangerous. Okay, what, yeah. what happens if you, to the geometry that you fix the temperature, say, say in the, the previous slide, you fix the temperature and increase the potential, what happens to the geometry of the, of the what yeah. do you mean? Big black what am I trying to do? Like I mean, the, which sort of singularity or whatever what do you say as I, as I move this side or, or as I? Um, what, I what, what, what should I do? So if you fix temperature and you, yes. and you increase oh. this potential up to that extremal value, like so you had a different branch, you had this upper branch. Yes. And that's that's gone completely out. What's happening to it as you're, what's happening to those? So like, I think this is not a good example. Yeah. So this one here, you're saying on the fixed temperature, 
and then trying to see how far I the what's, the, what's the potential I should get down to to I don't quite uh, see I don't quite so you're saying that the, I don't quite I'm asking what happens to the geometry as you increase by a and the actual black hole geometry you're not talking about the face the actual black hole geometry yeah yeah so there actually aren't that many truly spectacular things that happen it just the look the underlying geometry has very sort of polynomials, cubics, or they're not that bad even, but they have roots that, you know, as you tune the parameters smoothly, sometimes hit each other, and then, okay, one of them became smaller rather than bigger, stuff like that. So it was not actually that the geometry did something really strange. It's not the black hole that becomes very, very small. No, no. There, there's a few very special limits where it does. This actually is part of the danger of going, the order to go here. There you can't you can't get to here in a bad way where the black hole just disappear. No. Ah, and another thing you should ask actually that's a great note. I want to think a very good question. Should have asked, which is if I so here you know you know I could obviously construct black holes like this. Where did they go? Well, it was actually the small black hole branch that went further and further out, and this really literally disappeared. And they disappeared how by becoming small by by by. Alpha prime, thanks, yeah, what do you what do you name? Because that was what happened to those that large brands that went out, is that the overall scale simply went so small that we don't trust them anymore. So before they literally disappeared, they became so small that we don't trust them. But maybe something goes wrong when you analytically continue and this becomes not a good sort of complex metric anymore. You just fit in too much. So what Whitman was saying in his paper about this. You mean overspinning now? I mean that when you when the parameters go beyond when the when the branch disappears, no, no, I mean maybe the geometry doesn't become like a good geometry anymore, or it becomes a matter of good time. I mean, I, I think that's basically true. I haven't I've checked. Well, the geometry, geometry becomes super extreme, right? If you make them the rotation bigger than one. Rotation bigger than one. I think if there's a naked singularity, you could probably still write a metric, but you still have a solution. I don't know if it's a naked singularity or what it is. I mean, there are two things that can go wrong naked singularity or uh, close time like curves. And one of them happens. I just don't recall okay. when. I mean, bad things happen. Here be dragons. Don't go. Right? Like, I definitely would make super extreme if you were to take a limit where the temperature is going to zero or beyond. It is that to the extent you see the extreme of sort of a Q plus J, then you say, oh, but could, what if I'm extreme on one of them, not the other? You know, it's uh, I'm saying that you don't have good options. So. And I did that in the rank canonical ensemble, but if you did similar things in the canonical mixed ensembles, you'll see similar pictures that will be consistent with this. But I think you've got pictures enough for now. And then when phi goes to three, which is the critical life of example. Yes. Is it, in some cases, the black space you could see sort of marginal decay mode where there would be a gap of things that could combine into the thing or not under homogenized space. Does that happen? I think it is unclear. There is the there are signs that could be interpreted as there being a homogenized space, but nobody's been able to construct one. So was that over interpreting some things that are just like what you said? Well, they're similar to the black space where it meant this. Um, but now I have some of the signs, not all of them. Mm. And people couldn't construct one. And, um, yeah, I mean, they're clearly algebraic things that are similar, but is it just a mathematical curiosity or whatever? Mm -hmm. So, what I'm going to do, where are we at now? Well, I've discussed then these thermodynamics of non supersymmetric black holes in ADS5. Uh, rotation can go all the way up to one, and it tends to destabilize the electric potential. Can go up to three, tends to stabilize, you can actually go beyond three, no problem. So now, having sort of introduced that, I'll turn to the thermodynamics of the supersymmetric black hole, not sort of, you know, going to the limit, but more like being at the limit. And that corresponds to being in the corner of all the previous diagrams where you say, oh, there were none of them there. Well, when five was three, there was some of the curves that ended up near there. But Really, all the curves collapse in time to a point. They're no longer curves, they're points. And this is why I think that these things actually, I don't think, really have been drawn before. So, how should I even think about things? I have zero temperature, I have critical potential, I have 
critical omega identically. But as I need the grand canonical ensemble, I actually want to study it as a function of these things, which is tough when they have a specific value. So one way to think about it is that I'm going to go a little bit away from the critical value in all three of these parameters, and then take ratios. Particularly for the electric potential, I'm going to sort of think about going a little bit away from three, and then divide by the temperature. And then I'm actually going to take the limit. But right now you know I didn't really take the limit, I just took the ratio. But nevertheless, my notation prime, when that's five, you should basically think about as taking the derivative with respect to the temperature, because that's kind of what it becomes when you take T over zero. That's the same with the omega. And in particular, you should pay attention that I'm saying introducing the fine potential the way you actually do derivatives. So like omega minus omega prime. Remember, omega must be smaller than omega star. So therefore, you omega prime will always be negative. You can't go above one, but you could go a little bit below one. So you must get towards one from below. Your five for the side. So these you can think about roughly as temperature, as, as derivatives, but I don't think about it that way actually in Cicero. So let's try to recall how we use that meant for these things. Well, the partition function sort of adapted to the fact that we know there's a PPS limit, that the mass becomes equal to the sum of angle. Sum of charges and sum of electric charge and sum of angular momentum. But once I shifted things a little bit to take that into account, so that the mass here is a small one, if I was just near the DPS, this is small, this is small. Well, then I would think about the extreme limit of these, the one where I take the temperature of zero, to be exactly when this beta here flows up to so the one over T, becomes such that this goes to zero. Well, this one becomes its prime, this one becomes its prime. So I can think about this as being the BPS partition function gotten sort of as a limit. And that limit, I would say that the prime variable, so really the ones that I would introduce even from the get go. If I didn't get the BPS flat hole as a limit, I would just say, hmm, that what should I write as a partition function? This is what I would write. I have a black hole for each value, sort of like J and Q. And I'll say, oh, I better get them some fugacities. And I don't have the gas for mass, of course, because I'm a BPS. So this is what I would write. So my prime variables have been basically introduced that way as a limit, but I could have introduced them like this just from the beginning. Sorry, so you use the BPS relation to go from the first line to the second line? Did I understand no. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that takes temperature from zero. And as I do that, the mass will go down here. I'll show you more about the limit later. But the mass will go down here and take the temperature from zero. Well, is that anybody? Anyway, well, I shouldn't say will go. Okay. But that's certainly what I have in mind. That as I take the BPS limit, of course, the mass should go. And this is the zero order term in the temperature. And that's what I was going to emphasize right now, especially on the next one. It is not just a zero order, it's sort of this and the next one. So the black holes have free energy g equal to zero identically. And then we might say, oh, what happens to linear order? If I took a free energy to linear order and temperature, what would happen? Well, if you actually took a free energy that had linear order terms in M minus M star, and then Fourier transform that, or basically sort of changed, uh, changed uh, ensemble, you will see that what you learn from such a free energy that has linear terms in temperature is that you learn absolutely nothing. The linear terms are really descriptions of what happens on the BPS surface. This has been a student in terms of projective geometry, and I think that actually the nicest way of thinking about it, that the entire free energy becomes, as we go near the BPS surface, projective. Everything appears only as ratios. So therefore, even though the temperature goes to zero, it always appears divided by something that also goes to zero. Therefore, the entire free energy, even though I sort of thought about it as being linear to these small quantities, in actual fact, it isn't real. This is why I prefer to say, I didn't even take the temperature to zero. I wrote a derivative anyway, but I didn't have to. I just had to expand every single thing to linear order. And then it becomes a projected geometry. If you went the other way and saying, you know what, what would it mean if I just took some free energy that happens to describe BPS black holes? Okay, it must have n equal m star. What does that mean for a free energy? Just sort of looking at it. What is the relation that, that the free energy as function of its potential must satisfy? 
it must satisfy being homogeneous. So therefore, once I've taken the limit close enough that I'm homogeneous, it's the same as saying this free energy is a DPS free energy. Even closer, I take the actual limit, but hey, that was not even the point. The point was that I'll get close enough that this thing become projective, only ratios appear, and that is my super symmetric position function. And it satisfies, of course, the first law, sort of like this, that this would be the more general first law, that would be an entropy sitting over here and a T, and then that T is the one that we kind of divided out by, and then the potentials here of both kinds have become prime potentials, so divided by T. But this is where I like the projective formulas much better than the limits because the limits, there's so many things that can blow up. And you know, uh, this one here is very clean actually. Yeah. I'm confused. So you want to compute G to linear order in the temperature? Yes. But linear order in everything. Okay. But temperature and phi minus phi star and omega minus omega. Why do you say M equal M star is sufficient? I'm saying that if you write down that is sufficient, this was not. If I write down an arbitrary G, it's a function of phi, T, and omega, mm -hmm. actually arbitrarily many chemical potentials, all right, and temperature. And I say, I would like that free energy to determine something that is, in fact, satisfied the PS relation that corresponds to it being homogeneous for degree one. All right, so I have G, and I say, oh, it's some function of some chemical potentials and temperature. Oh, wait a second, how do I find a mass from that? Well, I guess I did one shape with the data. Yeah. Minus something or whatever, and I say that really has to be n, which is itself some sum of mu's times charges or whatever. And I say, what did that really mean? Many of some genes. That, 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 that's that's the relation. So, so it's one. So I, I guess the, my confusion is that if g is the linear order in p, then m should be a quadratic order in p. No. Well, I think according to that relation, that's what one does, right? Like G goes like one over beta, so if I take a derivative, it's one over beta squared, right? I, I see what you're saying, and I've been confused at that exact spot. Okay. Multiple times, and got done confused. Let's take it on note that. When I have that. I mean, this is elementary thermodynamics. Like, there's not like I'm hiding anything, but the limits can be really confusing. Um, but but I mean, I'll show you the next order later. This is just linear. So, I see why he's saying that it's free energies or beta. Well, I think you define G as having beta and not down, right? It's not, it's log over beta. Well, let's talk afterwards. Energy is like t to the fourth and four dimensions. So entropy is, is third. This is one of the energy, it's the fourth. Therefore, go to linear order, doesn't really give you much. Go to the next order after that, if you know. The energy. Entropy is linear. You're correct. That's interesting. I didn't get it in there. Entropy all did this. Let me give you an interpretation, though, of this thermal derivative, which I introduced. So I suppose I started to do thermodynamics, or perhaps I had some Euclidean path integral or whatever else. I tune various parameters that way. That certainly is a way. But it's always ways to say, what happens in space time? You try to persuade me that these prime variables are in fact the interesting thermodynamic variables, but you've got them as some kind of funny limit or projected geometry or whatever. What does it mean? Well, one way you can think about it is that if we were not at the horizon, but just outside, the temperature wouldn't be zero. The local temperatures measured by an actual detector would be slightly non zero. The electric potential would be slightly different from its critical value, and so would omega. So these would be actual physical measurables. And then you would say, how do I take the derivative here? Well, this was slightly outside. The thermal derivative, in fact, will become exactly the same as the radial derivative up to the numerical constant. So there are the prime potentials. Even though I emphasize it's defined as for derivative respect to temperature, if you were to say, I really prefer that it's derivative respect to radius, you would be right as well, except for the numerical constant. So they have to say that the five prime is the electrical field. It's also correct. It's a point of view that's much more friendly to the space time. 
of saying that what happened at the horizon was that for a non extremely black hole, you should write the first law in terms of the potential of the horizon. For an extremely one, write it in terms of the electric field. But both sort of mentally easy larger electric field, larger charge, larger potential, and much the same thing. You know, they're not that dissimilar, really, uh, sort of intuitively. But that's the actual relation is that radio derivative and thermal and thermal derivative play the same role. It's just a matter of whether you prefer being in a step making kind of picture or prefer to be in a space time. Kind of so now we'll get to the BPS temperature. So, what do I mean by that? Well, the dirt temperature is zero, the supersymmetric. Well, what can I possibly use as a temperature? Well, some features of uh, physical temperature is that you kind of have in mind that it's kind of large when the states are really highly excited. There's a large free energy and stuff like that. And we almost always insist that the temperature is positive, else things are really crazy. So when I look at my variables, my five primes and omega primes, because of this that many way of writing them, when they're small, they will tend to favor highly excited states because they don't suppress the highly excited state very much. But the one that is really positive and that kind of guarantees to be positive is actually the one that's created from the rotation. So what I do, kind of because is the best I can do is that I'm going to define my BPS temperature as being the inverse of the rotational velocity. Because I knew that the rotational velocity was negative, I know that this quantity here is going to be a positive number. As we have the feature, as that number gets bigger and bigger, it's going to favor highly excited things. When you say excited, do you mean uh, no? I mean large quantum numbers. Oops, wrong way. Not the BPS. Oh, I, yeah, I guess meant that these J's and Q's here are not going to be suppressed so much. So, uh, well, anyway, so yeah, these are small. So these ones here, they're going to be negative here, I guess. But anyway, that it's, it's going to, large numbers are not going to be suppressed so much. I see my signs are so not ideal for that. But that was the thing, was that as my, normally when my beta is small, I'd say that, that oh, good, this one here tends to, no pedal, not, not a big penalty for large ones. So here I'm taking the same logic that whenever I move around in my BPS space, I would where where what how should I tune up potential so I don't get much penalty for many for when whatever is big. And when you say BPS, how many returns do you? Total, two. Is that enough to continue and actually ask what you are? It's a good question. I mean, could or should or you know, we're confused. Aren't you the one to escape BPS thing in the four? That would be a very reasonable assumption. Well, why do you think that's oh, correct? I'll right. right. tell you why there's been some confusion on this exact point. I mean, there's just an app question. Is one to keep another protection to be paid or not? But well, some of the 116 uh, uh, representations have that problem, but there are other 16 representations that don't. The representation we're named for is, is kind of a bit more complicated. Uh, and the 116s that are protected give enough space to account for your energies or, you know, that? Okay. Maybe. Okay. I mean, I, I think the answer to that is yes. You know, but there's a but. But for now, we're just saying that this was sort of the background for what I actually showed you early on. The free energy here that I call W really was the free energy in temperature units. The effective tau here was the one of omega prime. So going this way out means rotate along. Of course, they all rotate at one, but it's more like, yeah, yeah, but how long? You know, so as I say, this predictive geometry, we could make some of it more close to one than others. And there was a precise way of doing that. Sorry, quick question. I, I know you're about to make the analogy to Susie, but for everything that you said in the previous slides, I thought that all goes through without any supersymmetry. Is that, am I wrong or like, right? The so, analogy between externality and it does not. not. So, in the when I said projective geometry, I actually meant. When I said this thing about the mass, mass is a linear function of charges. But that is not enough for just a zero temperature. 
because that's just saying that I take the lowest mass in a given charge sector, but that may not be a linear function of the charges. That follows some sort of symmetry. But you know, but certainly they're similar. But but there is a difference here. So these diagrams are similar. They look similar. Are they in fact the same? Well, we checked. They're not. Um, one concrete specific thing is that if you say that your tau here, well, it didn't really mean anything. I made it up. But I really want to make it similar to the physical temperature. Well, then when I compare the small black hole branch, I say, okay, actually that's nice. This one here really went like t to the minus q for the you know Schwarzschild EDS. It was like tau to the minus q for the BPS. That's great. It seems like I had luck with my tau defining it as if it was a real temperature. However, if you look at the high temperature of the large branch, you don't really like t cubed, go for t squared. So it looks just from that point of view, that's certainly not conclusive, that the BPS black holes are a little bit more like a gas in two spatial dimensions than in three. The spin goes like t cubed, so it goes like t squared, so t cubed. One might say, hmm, maybe I should think about a model with two spatial dimensions. But I'm not really advocating that, but just saying that's a mnemonic. Yeah. Is that's certainly how I'm thinking about it, but I have not managed to find a geometrical way of, I mean, you'll, you'll see some of the, 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 the microscopics to see, does that support that view? I don't know if it really does. I'm trying to uh -huh. massage these things around so that it will support that view or not. But, uh, but that seems to be a reasonable hypothesis uh, that the rotation basically switches you out. So there's one important thing that actually has to do with the question that came just there, externality versus uh, versus BPS. It turns out that all these BPS black holes must satisfy a constraint. The kind of charges and momenta actually be three different charges. I'm just not writing the formula of all three because meal mess. This is just messy. So for any charge, you cannot necessarily make a supersymmetric. If you chose the black hole charges from the beginning and just put them down on paper and they did not satisfy this, there are no supersymmetric black holes for that charge population. There will be microspace for that charge population, but there are not any supersymmetric black holes. The corollary to that is that there are two ways to break supersymmetry. One is that, well, zero temperature. It's like taking the lowest mass, extremal mass, so the lowest mass given conserved charges. And from that point of view, you will say, how about breaking supersymmetry? Well, I take one that's not the lowest. In other words, kind of add a little temperature with more energy. But there's a novel kind of supersymmetry breaking here that says, well, why don't I just violate that constraint? If I choose the charges so that they nearly satisfy this, but not quite, but still take the lowest possible mass in that charge sector. I have something that is a zero temperature, but it violates this, so it's not supersymmetric. So two ways of breaking supersymmetry. Sorry, well, where does that constraint come from? What's that? Oh, I hear from here. I'm I'm saying the solutions happen to satisfy this. I'm not suggesting there's an underlying in, uh, insight. I would come to some insight, but the solutions only exist if this is true. Go try and find some. If you say, oh, but couldn't I possibly just start differential equations out there? Yeah, but you're going to reach a singularity before you got a horizon. Mm -hmm. So you didn't really dig it. You did something sensible. Just one more, just one small caveat, which is that that's assuming that all fields are turned off except the gauge field. I oh. think like there is numerical evidence ah. there are supersymmetric black holes that have yeah. air. Yeah. Well, this is fair. This is fair. I'm, um, yeah, uh, well, I, I would say more that I'm assuming a certain small amount of symmetry. How many you want isometries must I have in my ansatz? Then I can write my differential equations on my claims become true. But if you say, well, yeah. why do you have that many? Which was like two, it was very little. Yeah. <laughs> but um, what do you say, well, yeah, I think uh, like uh, George Santos has a paper no, saying exactly. that there are like super yeah. symmetric solutions that yeah. don't satisfy that. And, and that is very, very interesting. And um, yeah, I mean, but it's not very actionable. And those are I, I mean, what? Those solutions that George Santos. If they're beyond the computer, they're numerical. So it's sort of, 
there is like some problem with that. So, what I understand, so, so whether they really should be taken seriously, or are they stable? Are they, you know, there are all sorts of questions. So, should they really be taken seriously? Don't know. Like non-TV solutions, the variety is stable, or yes, yes. Found, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They look perfectly sensible. It's just that it's like curve, 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 yeah. one yeah. extreme curve. It's an example of that. That is where we break supersymmetry the wrong way, not by taking the integral Q, which is the good sensible way where you keep supersymmetry, but taking the integral J. You have no supersymmetry, but it is extreme. I think that's the good way it really exists. <laughs> <laughs> so old fashioned. <laughs> <laughs> but from this point of view, it was sort of the one that did not first come to mind. So, therefore, it follows that when I go away from externality, I shouldn't just have a temperature. There's sort of one potential that takes you away from externality. What potential is it? Well, is this linear combination? This linear combination, if I keep it zero, that will actually be sufficient that if I, from the beginning, satisfy my constraint, I will still satisfy my constraint. But if I make this combination non-zero, I will violate my constraint. So I should keep it zero if I'm interested in staying on my BPS surface, but if I don't, I go away, and then I will get corrections, and the corrections in the max will be quadratic in terms. They will not be linear in terms, they will be quadratic in temperature, as we indeed agree on. But it's not just quadratic in temperature, it's quadratic in this here and in that. There's sort of both options for going away. And actually, in many ways, you know, equally good. So as you would certainly know, this is, uh, you know, describing these excitations here by the Schwarzschild theory, and I will not say any more, other than it is interesting actually computing this coefficient here. I mean, I've certainly done that. And one particular thing is that this thing here has the same coefficient in front of these two. So it gives us a little bit of insight into actually these other things, other way of breaking supersymmetry that's not adding energy. What is that? That is the R charge. It's giving the wrong R charge. You know, so if I give it the black hole the wrong R charge, it won't satisfy supersymmetry. In a way, you might say, well, it's still supersymmetric. Yeah, yeah. But it was the wrong R charge in terms. So, so it's the wrong supersymmetry. So um, this is what happens. It is interesting that the same coefficient, and you can think about from the Schwartz and theory point of view, that being contained in the program and equal to specifically, that the temperature breaks in sort of the same way as R symmetry. And they are sort of equivalent. Um, so uh, that's how it works. Um, More interpretation of this applied crime, the one that says, let me break my constraint. Also, the BPS limit certainly would have, well, phi equals zero and temperature equal to zero. You saw the mass would go above, but shows either one of them not zero. But if I think about the BPS limit as an actual limit, I have to take these things to be zero. But what about their ratio? Can I take that non-zero? And I'll say, well. Yes or no, it depends on what you want to do. You know, the potential is contribute to the constraint on the charges. Of course, at some level, I would say, well, I actually like to have a first law like this so I can differentiate with respect to phi prime and separate with respect to omega prime. That way I can find Q and J and check that I really have the constraint. Um, alternatively, I could just solve the constraint once and for all and think that they're related to one another. So from this point of view, what we can say is that the phase of the supercharge that's underlying my theory is actually sort of relative to the preserved supersymmetry. So the phi, if I choose to be zero, it means that I've chosen it wisely. If I choose to be non-zero, I've chosen to introduce an R kern that was not well adapted to my supersymmetry. The supersymmetry is not close on. But you say, yeah, yeah, that's not too bad. Isn't it just a shift? It is. So that shift is what gives you this quadratic extra curve. Uh, you know, so um, so so you can you find your variables. Um, but the M equal M star is preserved. You know, M equal M star is true as long as there's some supersymmetry that is preserved. If I take a particular supersymmetry as preferred, then I have to not violate the R charge I've created by substituting. So, uh, getting towards the end, but I was going to say a little bit about the microscopics. 
um, which no doubt will give questions four slides or so. So first of all, obviously, when I start with a different approach, it's key to change notation to make everybody confused. So instead of having five omega primes, strictly yes, you use delta and little omega. That is actually because it's pretty standard when people do the microscopics. And I couldn't, for example, not have capital omega for rotation of velocity when I did GR. So hard, to, hard to get everybody happy. And then what do you do? Well, you take your A equal four super your notes, and actually by now quite a lot of different ways of analyzing this. But the lowest tech one is to say that free N equal four super your notes is just three complex scalars, a gauge field, suitable fermion partners. And those are in fact what we're going to call letters, single fields like we just write down. These are eight different constituents, or however many, however, depending on how you count them as complex or real or whatever. And then you should take multiple guys of those and multiply them together. From your letters, you form words. In other words, you get composite operators. In the process, you should also include derivatives. Derivatives should be either think about as letters or as sort of just a different way of composing them. But whichever way, you end up getting words that has potentially, you know, many different many different letters in it. And then you expansion. I guess you say, oh yeah, but that was just one operator. I can have multi-operating states. So I should have basically Fox space of such guys. Is the plethistic experimentation because actually I should be careful here. I should make sure these things are gauge invariant. I should first take the trace before the experimentation, then make sure that it was cyclic. And I had a somewhat complicated common for a problem that obviously has been solved once for all. So that's what this is for, is that I do my combinatorics and I impose my gauge cyclic condition, which actually the hardest part is that each of these things were in by a matrices. I have to make sure that each of my sentences were each of my words, sorry, were gauge invariant, and then take it from there. The result of all this is that we have a unitary matrix model. So it's just a relatively friendly matrix model with a partition function. This is a partition function for my basic five letters that can rotate or have R charge. And when you combine actually the uh, you know different ingredients, which I just mentioned, scalars, gauge field, and so on reasonably economical the single letter partition function and then you have to do this to it multiply them by some n and you know some over an exponential and so on that is how you do the extra operations with words and sentences and the trace u stuff is the one saying that yeah and all of these things were actually a joint representation better make sure that you're integrable and used in such a way that you form singlets so that's the hard part but it's just like written other results, localization, data and stuff, whatever, gives the exact same thing. So, you know, this was not, this is sort of not the hard part. But then there's the story about, okay, good. Now I'm gonna find you some type of data of the end of this thing. Well, the consensus until just a few years ago was that this single particle index that I actually wrote as one minus something that happens to be positive. So it was manifested less than one. And it turns out if you look at the matrix model, the underlying unitary matrix model, if f is less than one, what that means is that the repulsion due to the fundamental determinant exceeds the potential that tries to get eigenvalues together. Therefore, when f is less than one, the eigenvalues will spread out and actually become uniform. Uniform means that we have a confined phase. It means that, you know, a particular order parameter is one and so on and zero, whatever, but, but you know, it means that the eigenvalue distribution does not give something interesting. The new consensus that has risen in the last few years is that's all wrong. And the mnemonic for that, and again, there are three or four different ways to reach this actually technically, but they all start with that somewhat ugly interval, but at least explicit, and then analyze it, is that the naive average you should have taken was instead of saying, you know what, this is all what I want, basically the trace use here become entirely uniform, so it's like one. But no, 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 they become n squared. In fact, not exactly n squared, it's exactly half n squared. Think about them as being randomly sines and cosines, and just, you know, everybody knows the sine squared is a half. That's true. I mean, that's the mnemonic. It's not actually what happens, but, you know, it's like, hey, what do you think? Should be one or n squared? Yeah, you know? So, um, that was a joke. <laughs> but, but, um, but you know, the end of the game though is that the form 
the actual form of the free energy, as it is dependence on all the potentials, did not change. It was only the free factor that now has become half n squared instead of one. The key feature in all this stuff that I don't describe is that all oh, these potentials, delta and omega here, and you said there was one minus something, and if something were exponential, the thing was positive, was that, oh, are you sure? Because what if these deltas were imaginary? If they had imaginary parts, then it's a little bit harder to stare at and see, hmm, actually, is it positive or negative, or what is it? And that had not been noticed early on, and I think it hadn't been revisited for a long time, in part because uh, these are some pretty intimidating people that have done a really good job early on, and I think it had not occurred to them that they would get it wrong, but they did. So let me say a little bit more now, just have just you know, sort of very briefly introduced the microscopic ideas. The supersymmetric index is the key idea that people are using for these things to try to make them precise. Want to cancel fermions off bosons because they could perhaps combine and become a long representation, and that's a bad thing because they could a lot of corrections and so on. So we do indices in my notation here, where I use omega delta, but also omega prime phi prime on the gravity side. This is what I have in mind. You notice there's a question mark, and I'm the exact same thing. I'll say shortly. But the minus one to the f is inserted in such a way the superpartners cancel. Those are some fermions that I said supermultiple cancel. But there's an important caveat, of course. The standard is that I've given these various for gases. Well, these fermions and bosons will cancel if they have the same fugacity. That doesn't count if the supercharge that we're acting with, in fact, itself has some charge under these fugacity. So I have to make sure, like, oh, yeah, that doesn't count. I should really make sure that doesn't happen. This means that I have to take one of the fugacities to be zero. Which one? By prime. So the one that I previously said, that was the one that I could use to break supersymmetry and go away from the BPS surface. That is the one that is illegal from the point of view that it would not commute with a supercharge. It's not really that bad. So if I didn't use it, I said, well, I kind of just deform over to something that corresponds to a different supercharge. So it's not that the states aren't supersymmetric. It's just that the whole index thing fails. It don't cancel properly. But it still are supersymmetric. This is an important detail because it means that when I try to turn on phi prime, if I did, I'm not really breaking supersymmetry quite as badly as just adding a mess. I kind of just say, well, it's my cancellations that have failed, so I can create large multiplets, which is sort of bad, and therefore I lost control. I agree with that. But it's a different form of breaking supersymmetry than other things. And it matters because. That means that I can actually microscopically go and count states that do not satisfy the constraint. And a lot of them. It's just that we somehow presume that, yeah, but well, maybe they don't survive to strong coupling. Okay? Um, maybe. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how grandma will go. So, you know, but that's the story is that I could turn on this potential here. The index will no longer be index. So I don't really have any justification for analyzing things that way. But I still have a question. Wonder what happens when phi prime is turned on, it's going up, and it's still not balanced. This immediate question is not there. Then the other comment I want to say is the cancellations to this minus one to the f. The reason that you could get order one over n, order one, is that minus one to the f is incredibly efficient in this case at canceling. It actually cancels large numbers of states incredibly efficiently, sort of too many. The trick that people figured out recently was that. These omegas and deltas here, give them a phase. And if you give them a good, well chosen phase, this thing still commutes with the supercharge. And that's actually saying, oh, you don't want you to my prime to be zero. You insisted. That's what I said. Yeah. I insisted because that was the thing I needed to get my cancellations to work. But people would say there's another possibility take five prime to two pi i. That also is sufficient. And that gives a much higher growth because that is such that you actually have these cancellations much better obstructed. And then it gives a much higher growth. So that was the thing that had been overlooked and now it wasn't overlooked. It wouldn't be natural for me, of course, from what I studied earlier, where everything was from a super gravity point of view, which would have asked very bad questions if I say take the rotation to be too high, I, you know, so, you know. But 
you know, and it's an interesting question to actually analyze what this means at the level of the solution. We can actually do it in the geometry or complexify it correctly, but I don't know the answer is. Um, but at any rate, this is the story. There's a space time interpretation of that too, but actually, this phi here, which is kind of electric minus rotation, it actually turns out that, yeah, with the electric field, once things rotate, it has a magnetic partner. And it seems that the imaginary part of this pi i is precisely the magnetic field that has to be turned on. So there's some kind of space time interpretation of this too. And that's what I'm calling the attractor mechanism. And I'm hoping to be writing people like that very soon. So that's the summary. If the PS5 holds an ADS5 are very, very similar to just ADS scorcher and vanilla. And then I introduced this formula of you know, thermodynamics of the PS5 holes that I call projective thermodynamics or intrinsically DPS or with the two limits. And then I talk a bit about the important role of that five fine potential that is a new sort of the index should, should be average over that direction where things don't can properly, should be average or, or not, or, you know. So, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ben. And if there are any questions, including from the Zoom. Uh, I, I had a question about yeah. this uh, by prime on the last slide. Mm -hmm. Previous slide. So in gravity, you started by computing the grand canonical partition function, yes, sir. right? So wouldn't you say that there to compute an index, you actually need pi prime to be to pi i as well? Um, yeah. So that is, uh, yeah, so uh, I agree. So some people have done this. Some people have said that that is the correct way of doing the second applicable version of an index. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is to deduce to pi from the word go. And I, I, I'm sympathetic. Uh, I'm just uh, have not analyzed the actual solution that they're implying. If then once you can down to the infinity, you should check further in whether that solution was in fact a good solution. Of course, that is uh, even more interesting to do now in, in view, for example, this Whitney criterion. So, okay, so it's a complex job. Yeah, I think, I think they're all valid. Is it a good one? Uh, I don't know, but, it, but it's a bit of an elaborate one. So it's not that soft to right. check, but, but it's presumably a good one. Okay. So, so I agree, I agree yeah, that that's a, so you can think about this as reasonable from a Euclidean from that point. Absolutely. Can I make sure I have the punchline right? Is the punchline that you have a UN gauge supergravity, you have a set of attractor black holes there are some charges, and you can match those to what a 116 BPS states and we pick up on the Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah, and there are different ways of writing that. There's even actually a really neat different way. So you can write quantum mechanics so you can do it that summarizes the. Uh, and that's pretty new, and I am, I'm, I'm going to, but uh, you know, that's what they say. All right. Then it'd be like, oh, wow, thanks. <laughs> it is just by the book. So I think this is the same as Luca's question. So this like, imaginary angular velocities is. Okay, certainly in circumstances I know it's, it's the, the easy geometric thing to get real Euclidean solutions. I guess here you say yeah, you know, but this this is not quite good enough for that. These are not these are not real Euclidean solutions. There's too much look the angular momentum and the and the, and the uh, rotation, they are too they're too entangled. I mean so if this is this would work if it was a curve, you're correct. But here somehow the mixture is worse. Um, it's doing these magnetic fields that, that are somehow they, they so look, it's just complex, doesn't mean bad, yeah, but it means you care. So this is once you've got because you've inevitably got some electric charges turned on, as yeah. well, or right. But from that's... my point of view, though, I would also say that, of course, it's very good to say that, look, I if I just had a good Euclidean form, you know, pathological, that that's all I want, it's not. I also want to understand what happens in the geometry near the horizon. I mean, what happens in the actual geometry? And here, basically, the flow from U V to I R does not quite commute with, with taking these with taking these special values of potentials. So, so they sort of. Uh, but with this open the ADS type, what it yeah, like, is it the same thing? as like the, an imaginary delta would correspond to a real rotation 
in the Euclidean section in the S5. Is that, is that right? No, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah so for the technique yeah. point of view, there may be real solutions that then they yeah. don't want to reduce, they become. No, I think they're complex. Yeah, they're complex. complex. <laughs> There's no way out. It's just that if you're saying, look, hey, Quantum gravity doesn't make really sense anyway. It hasn't been clear in quantum gravity. It's the only thing that makes sense, which is, you know, I view by some. Then I think you'd be very comfortable with this. Well, it's the natural thing when you're doing computing partition functions. That certainly at finite temperature, it's a, it's a very natural way to do it. Zero temperature, okay. That was kind of how we started out for it. Zero temperature is sort of, yeah, but it also means the horizon geometry continues kind of in a fun way. So we didn't do all that as a limit, and that's where you know no way of doing it. That's not as a limit, but just do it. And uh, that that makes it more comfortable. Right? Just having trains. Right? All right. Well, if there are no more questions, then let's thank Finn again. I guess I speed it up enough to catch yeah. the final.